If you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like to start a conversation by just having, uh, for those who may not know much about McKesson, have you describe uh, what excites you about it. How does it fit into the healthcare ecosystem? Because I know it is a myriad of activities, and it's, and it's an older company, too, in terms of just the, the background. Well, that's a great question. It is a complex company, and, and most folks have never heard of McKesson because we're really uh, uh, a service provider inside of healthcare. In some of our businesses, we'll see uh, patients directly. Uh, our, we have an oncology business that is very uh, uh, heavily involved in patient uh, uh, treatment. We have a, a bunch of uh, uh, owned pharmacies and retail in Europe, in particular, where we touch patients every day with our, our own teammates. But most of our businesses are inside uh, of other people's businesses, and so. Our, our focus really has been on uh, how do we improve the patient experience both on a clinical outcomes basis but also on an economic basis and, uh, and how do we increasingly connect uh, patients uh, uh, to the system of healthcare in a more complete way and, that, and that's clearly what part of this is all about is how does technology and analytics and data play a role in bringing the patient closer to what is a complex frightening experience. and. Uh, and so our, our mission really is to help our uh, provider customers, whether they're hospitals or pharmacists or physicians, uh, uh, be more successful with their patients on both those economic and clinical dimensions. And if they're successful with the patient, uh, we'll be successful in, in, in our relationship with our customers and helping them build those relationships with the tools that a very large corporation can, can help deliver that on their own they may not be able to deliver. So I, I grew up in the small town of Alexandria. There was a, a great retail pharmacy there, Trum Drug, which is a, a, had been a, is a big customer of, of McKesson's. And our job is a Health Mart pharmacy, which is one of our fr uh, franchise operations, is how do we help that family uh, in multiple generations own and operate a pharmacy when you're competing with uh, big uh, grocery store chains and, and, uh, and mass merchants that are, are putting tremendous pressure uh, from a competitive perspective. So we have been around 185 years and, and uh, we started with clipper ships bringing drugs from Europe and uh, have evolved into almost every aspect of healthcare including technology uh, today. So you're doing drug reimportation? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. And I've been the CEO for 185 years. <laughs> So my term is just I've about done. Senate, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah. a, like a Senate appointment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so as, as healthcare is consolidating, and we see that with hospital consolidations, and actually increasingly now, you know, there's, it's hard to say like who's who's buying who, whether insurance companies are buying providers and vice versa. And this conference is really about uh, data and analytics, how we use it. How do you see McKesson, or how do you, how's McKesson's role is actually in potentially making that easier, maybe consolidating some of that database, maybe bringing a little more clarity to it? How, how can you folks connect those dots in a way, given the broad complexity of what you have? Well, that's also a very big question. You know, there are, there are significant players in the system today that have significant amounts of data. You mentioned. Uh, the payer consolidations with, uh, in this case, uh, one with a, a PBM uh, and one with a PBM slash retailer in the case of CVS and Aetna. And those organizations are going to have a significant amount uh, of data that will allow them, I think, to do a, a much better job of, of understanding uh, the differences in, in the way care is delivered, uh, the different economic models associated with those care plans, uh, hopefully a more outcome, uh, more uh, consumer-facing uh, uh, environment. But if, if I think about, uh, about our role and our expertise, we, we have a very large technology business that we've been building since the 1960s. And, and uh, our experience there is that the, no one person or one entity has all the data. And I, and I don't know that, that we, will, we will find in the next few years any single entity that has a hub of all of the data or a repository of all the data. So how do we connect it together? How do we, how do we uh, uh, use it, make it usable? How do we make sure that we have the rights to use it? Uh, one of the biggest challenges in healthcare data is who owns that data? Who should own that data? And what are the privacy responsibilities uh, that, do corporation, that we as corporations have? What, what responsibilities does the government have? And, and what ownership should the patient have uh, over their own data? And you know, f frankly, I know, I know you and I are aligned on that, on this, but you know, one of the things that we should be doing is empowering uh, the consumer to be more informed. And, and you know, I, I uh, was the author of a best-selling book called Skin in the Game that came out, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. All three copies were given to my daughters. <laughs> I have one. I have one. <laughs> so I guess I sent one to you. And all of them went back on, uh, on the Internet and were resold very rapidly for pennies on the dollar. Uh, uh, but having said that, the, you know, my, my view is that, is that these industries are, this industry in particular, 
is so complex uh, that if we think that a policymaker or a single corporation can reform the healthcare system in a way that will create the healthcare system that all of us want to inherit, and, will, and once it's perfected, it'll be great forever, I, I think is naive. If you look at any, uh, all of you that are in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this program, the, what technology is doing to rapidly uh, innovate in, in every other industry uh, uh, can be brought uh, to healthcare, and part of that is, is an informed consumer that's making decisions for themselves with some economic skin in the game, frankly. Uh, uh, and that doesn't mean they have to pay for it out of their own pocket, but they have to have an interest in what things cost. And they have to have some visibility to uh, w what their problem is in a way that they can understand it and what the solution set alternatives are to their problem and who might provide uh, the best value, uh, economic outcome as well as a clinical outcome. And uh, I don't know whether we can ever boil it down to a consumer reports uh, Harvey ball that if it's uh, the way we did the automobile industry and we'd, we'd, we'd flip through those pages and, 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 uh, and make our own choices. Usually the argument against this, and I know you've heard it as well, is that uh, uh, our populations are just not sophisticated enough in a complex world to make their own decisions. And I, f I frankly don't buy it. I, I think there are certainly pockets where payers or family members or easy to read scorecards uh, need to be there to help inform patients on their, on their decisions. And I, I know we help make decisions for our children and our aging parents, all of us do. Um, but in the end, those consumers will change the way healthcare is delivered. And they'll go to the places where they can get the best care, where they can have access in their communities and not have to travel 400 miles. And, and, uh, and where they can do it in a way where they understand their personal uh, economic role in this and, uh, and they understand what the cost is going to be to them over uh, various uh, array of treatments and, and who, what the responsibility is of the insurance company. And we've been talking about it for 20 years. We don't know what anything costs until we get the bill and right. what our responsibility is. And that's not the way to reform the system. So I'm going to, I, I have a bunch of prepared questions. I'm going to throw you two wild cards uh, that are easy. Uh, this is but to be fair, okay. you can throw two wild cards back to me. Can you answer them? I'll tell you if I can. Okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I have a little pack here that I get buzzed directly okay. if I a problem. So, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad you brought up the book. I mean, I, you know, uh, what I love about- I didn't mention your book, but I should. No, you can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, okay. Okay. <laughs> you use one of your wild card questions. That's my wild card, okay. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have we'll, a book. We'll give another okay. one. Okay. Actually, okay. no okay. book at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, <laughs> you should have one. Okay, keep going. Yeah. So uh, what's great is that McKesson was really one of the first companies that supported Millie when we went way back, going back to 2006 when we started forming the National Industry Council. I'm tremendously indebted to the support that you gave to us way back then and some of the staff that were there. Um, that all said, of all the CEOs and the major companies we worked with, Medtronic, United, Boston Sci. You're the only one as a CEO that wrote a book. What inspired you to write a book, if I can ask? Uh, Did addition, you have to clear it off your board? In no, not with the board, <laughs> but in, in addition to corporate marketing. <laughs> so we were celebrating at the time our 175th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So part of the book is the history of McKesson's evolution for 175 years. It was going to start out as a pamphlet to our employees, and it became something bigger. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I. I I think that um, perhaps there are too many uh, CEOs that are, are unwilling to put a stake in the ground as to what, how they think things should go. I, you know, I've spent 35 years of my life in this industry, and I've seen it from almost every aspect. I should have an opinion. I didn't, I'm not surprised that no one valued it, but I should have an opinion, <laughs> and I, and I should, should be able to discuss it. So that was, it started out as a, as a company brochure, and that's really where it ended. But thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> I mean, has the, in the, I know when I've written these things that sometimes it's useful just as a, to get you a sense of your own guiding principles, now whether or not someone else reads it or not. Have you, have you found that many of the things that you articulated then are really still kind of truth points for you as you look at the system and how it's evolving and all its complexities? Well, I think that what's, what's interesting about my observations is that nothing's changed. It's a little bit like Groundhog Day. We just keep going around and around and having the same, the same debates, and that's, that's why I'm so convinced that we have to find a way to decouple uh, the economics of who pays from how healthcare uh, is, how, how a decision is made as to who's going to give me my healthcare. Mm -hmm. 
that's different than who's going to pay for it. And we, we blend the two together and we talk about single payer, we talk about different types of models, we talk about how, you know, in various insurance models. I think that those are all important things for us to have a discussion about. But in the end, I think we should empower individuals to make their decisions and they should have some skin in the game. I, I think that I, I probably shouldn't have a third hip when I'm 97 years old and I'm diagnosed with terminal cancer. Today, nobody's going to stop me from doing that. Mm -hmm. In fact, my family's not going to pay for it and I'm not going to pay for it. So who's, who's going to make that decision if I'm unwilling to make it myself? And this societal question is, is coming on us very rapidly. It's already happened in Europe and you can see what, what's happened in certain countries with, with cues and with uh, 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 denial of coverage or care in, in certain uh, uh, situations or unavailability of certain treatments or products. Um, that somebody's going to have to ration care in the United States and I'd rather have uh, all of you for your own families and yourselves ration care as opposed to having someone else ration your care. And I, I think there's a, there's a way to, to, to thread that needle. Now, I, I'm, I'm not the only voice in the, in the woods about this, but, I, but when we argue about who should get paid health care, well, that's fine. Let's find a way to provide the financial support for someone who can't afford health care otherwise. But that doesn't mean we should disconnect that person's responsibility for making some choices. Mm. And that's just my perspective. Still coming into a broad perspective here, one thing that was, that's been exciting is that as I attended the conference here today, I noticed that it wasn't just healthcare folks that were here. If actually just to the audience, how many folks are, your vocation or what you're doing is exclusively healthcare? Raise your hands. So that's the majority. How many is exclusively not? So about 20% of so. For those folks that are here, um, how would you explain to them, because I, I get this question all the time, I'm curious your perspective, why healthcare seems so different? than most other industries? Why, why, why does it need to have its own separate you know, MBA track? Why, does it, why can't it be just like um, you know, real estate or technology or something else like that? Well, f first of all, it's very personal. It, it, it's, it should be personal for all of us. Somebody's in the healthcare system today that we love and care about. And, and eventually, even you and I will be in the healthcare system. So we're, we're reinventing where we're going to land. And, and, and so that, that's personal. This, the second thing is the, the, the complexity and the, and the rapid rate of technological change that today we're doing things in healthcare that would never have been dreamed of before in, in terms of understanding how our own genetics uh, play a role and, and how our behaviors play a role and, and all of the various treatment op options. I mentioned we treat roughly 20% you know, of the cancer patients in the country in our, our oncology network and those, those patients Many of those patients today that are, are chronically ill um, on medication are going to die of something else other than the cancer they were diagnosed with that five years ago would have, have already lost the hair three times and we would have poisoned them four or five times trying to kill their cancer. And that, that change is happening so rapidly that, that even you know, the, the, the physicians and the great clinicians we work with are having a hard time comprehending the, the, the pace of change. So the pace of change, the personal nature of this and then the economics are so uh, uh, outside of our visibility. First of all, in many cases, we can't even understand or comprehend how could it possibly be that expensive. And secondly, we don't have any visibility to what it's going to cost until after it's done. Yeah. And even the, the people that are coaching us probably don't know what it's going to cost. The, the physicians and pharmacists that are entrusted uh, to our care uh, and, the, and the nurses, they, they, they don't know. And so it, it's an industry unlike any other industry that we've, we've got in front of us. And the, the, the government aspect of it, we shouldn't uh, underestimate. That every time someone else throws a, a rock in the river, whether it's a government or a, 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 a federal government, a state government, a regulator, the, the water changes its direction. And, and for the ability for the consumer and for those of us that are paid in the healthcare system as providers, um, those, those rocks cause distortions in, in, in how, we, how, how the economic system and how the clinical system flows. So I think those are the, probably the three things. It's a very personal business. It's a very complex, uh, increasingly complex and, and in, innovative business. And the third is it's being distorted by forces that are not typical consumer or market forces. Mm -hmm. There's, I, I agree with all those. Actually, one, I, I always think about this too because I get asked this a lot, is that particularly uh, in this school where we have a lot of folks that focus on the supply chain and they focus on the engineering paradigms and move the medical device. When you think about an engineering paradigm, generally you built that product. You, you understand its physics as best as you can and you're looking for tolerances to make sure everything is going the right way. And even when you're doing 
pure computer coding, your code typically doesn't have a life of its own. We're going to be getting to the artificial intelligence yeah. question in the end when the machines rule. But um, the, uh, we don't build our bodies. I mean, we, I think in, in the medical field, where I, reason, one reason why we were kind of advocating for Milly to be called Medical Industry Leadership Institute rather than healthcare was to give some acknowledgement to the physicians of the world and the world and what they have to do because they kind of have to innovate on the fly not necessarily having, if you will, the schema, the engineering schema of what's wrong with you. All, all of the raw materials at end of one. Right. The, there's never another human being that's going to be presented to them that has exactly the same characteristics. Right. There's no other manufacturing process where you'd have it completely out of control, where your raw material is not even something you can spec. Right. In fact, you don't even know what the raw material is until it presents. Right. And then the raw material leaves after you try to polish it and it goes out and does something else and presents again differently. You know, they lost 20 pounds and they gained 50, and they weren't smoking and now they're not, they are smoking. And so it, you're exactly right. It, it, it's unlike any other business. Right. So let's switch to a little bit, talk about some of, the, some of the themes we've had in this conference. Artificial intelligence has come up quite a bit. Um, what are your thoughts about artificial intelligence in the space? Is, is McKesson playing in that space? Are there certain things that you've managed to move in where it seems like it's a slam dunk fit, where the technology is really applicable in a way it hasn't been before. On a personal level, I'd like to have some artificial intelligence. <laughs> I, I don't know how mobile it is, but uh, at, the, at the corporate level, uh, yeah, we've, we've uh, you know, I, I would like to think that we have been innovators in technology uh, f for you know, over 100 years. Uh, and you know, we were one of the first companies to ever uh, use um, uh, in-store ordering. It wasn't really a barcode, but it was essentially the same kind of an idea where we'd our sales reps would go into the stores and do replenishment using a device in the store and then hook the device up to a phone and transmit orders. Uh, we were the first ones really to bring barcodes to patients on their wristbands in hospitals to try to make sure we could understand who the patient is and uh, log the nurse and the, and the medications, et cetera. Uh, so innovation has been a, a core of, of our business, both externally to our customers as it relates to how they, they, they process their clinical and financial activity, but also internally. So today, we're, we are replacing you know, 15 people uh, uh, with a simple machine robotic to do uh, 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 invoice processing and payables processing and all of the things that would, that would have taken people to, to, to deal with. And we, we have it, uh, uh, a track record now of, of making that work. And the automation in our facilities, we used to have distribution centers that we thought would max out at $200 million in revenues, and now we have distribution centers that have you know, seven or eight or 10 or $15 billion in revenues with half the number of people in place mm. because of, of the machines that are constantly uh, learning on the job, basically, and revising the way the work is done uh, to improve our productivity. So I, I'm extremely optimistic about where we're headed. I, I think there might be you know, uh, uh, another frontier we're, gonna, we're going to reach, which is really related to how do we bring uh, AI and, and data analytics to the patient populations because of various privacy rules, and like I, like I said earlier, who owns the data, how do we make sure it, it remains confidential, and how do we de-identify it? Uh, but that, I'm very optimistic about where we're headed. As, as a perfect lead up to the next question, which was, how should policymakers be thinking about data protection? And should it be entirely free market driven, or is there a rule for new rules and regulation for in that space? As much as I'm a free market person I'm in, on many levels, I don't think markets, any market, should be left to its own without some at least oversight and, and view of whether or not regulation would be helpful or hurtful. Particularly, particularly in things like patient privacy, uh, what we don't want to do is have a, a, a myriad of various uh, city, uh, county, state, local ordinances related to the way patient data is managed. It will be impossible for people in this room to scale big data and analytics organizations or to work across state boundaries if we allow this thing to become uh, a, a political issue at a state level where, where people are creating different policy. Um, so I, I hope it, it stays at a federal level or goes to a federal level and that we, we take some of the noise out of it. And, and I think that, um, it, frankly, a lot of people will say it should be up to the patient to make a decision as to whether their, their, their uh, data is uh, private or not. I actually think all of my data should be private as it, leads, as it, as, as it relates to identifying me. But that's different than saying my data is only my data. 
I, I think, and, and there's a boundary here as to can it be re-identified to me, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that what resides in the data, uh, no matter who has it today, is extremely valuable if we want to bend, bend the cost curve in healthcare, if we want to reduce the variability with the way uh, people are treated, if we want to understand how diagnosis is, are, how a diagnosis is made correctly and how it's made uh, uh, incorrectly, uh, those repositories of data will be extremely helpful. Now, what we need to do is, is, is to find a way to make sure that we've, we've um, f found a way to make us as patients feel comfortable while at the same time we don't destroy our ability to use the data to actually improve the way healthcare is delivered in this country. Yeah. One question that comes up that actually relates a little bit to, to finance sometimes, too, is, and economics, is it, would there ever be a situation where people have to start conceiving of a premium for privacy? In other words, um, if I make a decision and say my privacy is absolutely sacrosanct and I never want any of my data ever to enter into the ecosystem in terms of what's there, someone might come back to me and they say, okay, you can, you can have that, but um, your premium for health insurance, because we can't model you will go up 15 or 20 percent. Is, is, are, are you ever fearful that we're, that privacy might become too big a barrier and that the system might degrade or not advance in some respects? Uh, well, it could be, and plus you, you might end up with a, a, a bartering mechanism that wouldn't, wouldn't be helpful. I, I think the, 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 the challenge is, in my, in a, in a more s simple way, is just the scale of trying to accomplish anything where the patient has to do something mm -hmm. makes it very difficult. And so when people say, well, we ought to have the patient opt in, just the mechanics of having somebody opt into a program versus right. uh, opting out, assuming that they're in and we get to use their data for the following clinical purposes and we've, and we've signed a, a, in our policy statements that the data is not identified as Steve, but we want to be able to use your diagnosis and your, your uh, brain scan so we can determine who else has a tumor like yours because we fixed yours and we don't want to use the same treatment protocol seems to me to be a, a societal good thing. And uh, uh, so it, I, I, the debate's not over. I'm not an expert on privacy. I'm, all I'm pointing out uh, to, to the audience, especially those of you that are data experts, is that, is that this issue in healthcare is a little different than it is in, in the quality of a ball bearing. Uh, we, we've got a, it's, it just, it's much more complex and it's much more personal and, and it deserves to have a discussion. What we can't let the discussion boil into is, is 50 different policies and we, or, uh, uh, state policies or regulations and we can't let it bo boil into a hysterical uh, um, uh, walled off decision where somebody over here says we, we ought to have all the data and do whatever we want with it and somebody over here saying the data, the data can't ever be used because it's, it's people's data. And there's some place in the middle that will work right. in, in my view. I'm hoping to see that too. So two years ago, McKesson spun off the majority of its technology business to a new business uh, with Change Healthcare, formerly known as MDON. I guess it was based out of Tennessee at the time. It still is probably. McKesson still owns 70% of that business. Where do you see the market for claims data moving? Is a national hub part of the future for claims or the past, would you say? Well, we, we tried some, some experiments that led by the government. You recall the RIOs and other things that mm -hmm. were designed that were... Regional health information organizations. Yes, that were meant to, to scrape this data and create repositories where we could develop policy and expertise, uh, you know, better financial data, better clinical right. data. And it, it just it kind of collapsed under its own weight in some respects. Um, and maybe it was before its time from a technology perspective. Uh, so I, I think that... that, that um, our technology business, for instance, is, is a great example where these, these ideas of having data repositories that are, are um, it's like telling me to go, f my, my technology people will say it's, we're going to build a data lake and we're going to have people fish in it. Okay, that's great. If I don't know how to fish, I don't like to fish, I don't even know where the lake is, it's not very useful to me. So, so what, I, what we need to do is the intersection of, of data strategy and, and data and analytics and the business processes that are meant to use that data ne needs to be brought together, in my view, and, the, and, the, and that data needs to reside in the workflow. A, a great example would be uh, pharmacy data. Um, when, we, when we put pharmacy data in the workflow of a physician or in a pharmacist where they don't have to click out to a new screen and try to find it, I don't have to go out to Google and do a search and then go over to Amazon and do this and do that. If I can do it all in the, in, in, the, in the way I process my work every day, 
I'm much more likely to use that data. And in fact, if that data can populate with me not even having to know there was a lake and not having to find the fishing pole, I'm much better off. And so um, as, as, the, as the science of data evolves, the, the science of business and management and business operations can't be left behind. And for those of you that are, are more on the data side, uh, you need to help us make sure that the business people are involved in, in the way this is designed and used. And for those of you that are on the business side, uh, you're not going to get your questions asked and it's not going to be usable for you if all of these data uh, extractions are one off and, 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 and aren't designed to scale in a, in a simple way. So I, I think that, that, that business intersection with the, the technical ability to use data right. needs to come together and that's really what our technology business is designed to do. It's taking stuff that, as I mentioned, we've had, we've been building since the 60s, along with another great company that's been doing the same thing, that have big, not only repositories, but are the transmission lines or the hubs or the spokes of the, of the wheel, um, that, that, the pipes. What, what, can we, what can we do with those pipes that are already connected into workflow uh, to make the, the data that goes through them more usable? And how do we present um, the answers to questions that, are, that need to be asked and answered in a way that is convenient and uh, effective and efficient. And I think the, the, the challenges that we've had in, in these data activities is when they're not repeatable, where we, two people know how to fish, the lake isn't close by, we send them off to fish, they come back with the fish, and then we come up with a whole other design and we send them back and wait for them to come back again. There's a, there's a better way and it's being designed in places like this. Do you, to get to the next level, to get to a better lake <laughs> with greater interest, water better skiing, fishing water poles. Skiing. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Minnesota, water yeah. skiing is very good. Uh, do you think that role is, can be, who should take that first initiative to maybe take the next step? Should it be the private sector? Should it be government sector? Because for my, I mean, I'm, as an analytic person and as a health economist, probably 80% of my empirical stuff is based off claims data. And the only way I knew how to use it was I used to work in the insurance industry and it was back in an era before the optims of the world where if you were working in the early ages of managed care, you had to program all the data yeah. as well as talk to physicians as well as model what they want all at one time and, and still make time for some medical board meetings or something. Um, the, so I appreciated the data but I knew it was entirely clunky but as I got older I realized what else is there and also if the history of it, like the diagnostic codes and the procedures codes that are on that data was really uh, derivative of government initiatives for reimbursement practices, first for DRGs for prospective payment for the diagnosis codes, later for CPT4 codes right. because of RBRVS. I don't really see anything that's advanced claims data as an, or any data really as a national platform beyond that and I kind of wonder if we're going to see the innovation come from the private sector at broad scale, where's it going to be and when? I know it's a big picture question, but it, it's... But that's a big, that is a big picture question. I don't, I don't think anything can be done simply by government or simply by industry. Right. I think that the societal question for us, and you'll see the debate continue, is what, what role do, do we as citizens expect our government to perform and what role do we as business have a responsibility or as a physician do we have a responsibility, what role do we have to play? And you know, my view is that, is that there are certain things, like you said, the CPT codes and other things, that, uh, on pharmaceuticals we have NDCs. Right. And uh, standards have been set. The only reason we can process so many uh, pharmacy claims through McKesson's networks right. is those claim standards have been standardized. So everybody does it the same way. The only way the banking system works is the ATM standards have been standardized. Exactly. And so there are certain... And both of those are private sector initiatives, actually. Exactly. The, and, and there have been, uh, there, and there are um, uh, um, uh, lab codes that have been designed. Mm -hmm. AMA does some of these things. A AHA have, have done some of these things. So I think it needs to be done. The question of who does it could be up for debate. The, the, the challenge for us is when you, when you try to re-engineer a business model that you think is going to change everything and, and there's no other model to compete with it, we'll, we'll never get to the best uh, demonstrated outcome. Um, and I, I think that how do we encourage innovation in a world where regulation has taken such an important role mm -hmm. 
uh, is part of the challenge. What can they do with the claims data? What are they allowed to do with the claims data? Where is the clinical data? How does it intersect with the claims data? Do they really care about the clinical data as much as they care about the claims data? And, and who owns the patient claims or clinical data, right? Right. And th those are, are where you end up with some of those debates. Absolutely. Uh, another question with respect to McKesson. You acquired an interesting company in 2017, Cover My Meds, uh, which is a market leader for electronic prior authorization. Uh, you acquired Cover My Meds after you shed most of your tech business. What, what did you think Cover My Meds will offer from a data perspective, and how is it going to be valuable to you? going forward, would you say? Well, the, the technology, we kept a lot of our technology businesses at McKesson. Uh, the, the businesses that we kept were, were very relevant, we think, to the markets that we're very strong in. So pharmaceuticals is an example. Mm -hmm. um, the the, the uh, Cover My Meds acquisition builds on that pharmaceutical platform, and it's really related to electronic prior authorizations uh, for patients who have to have a prior authorization before a med can be dispensed or written for them. Maybe it can be written but not dispensed. The ultimate check is, is usually the pharmacy or the infusion provider or whoever it is that's providing that medication to the patient. And so the, what we want to try to do is inform the physician when they're writing the prescription that this, this is not going to be paid for automatically by the, the payer unless there's a, a meeting of the minds as to whether this is the right drug for the right patient. It's usually economically driven because the expense of the wrong drug is waste, mm -hmm. uh, and if it's a, s a small drug and it's generic, I'm not going to police what you do as a doctor. If it's a $300,000 dose that may not cure the patient, I may want to have a voice in that as the payer uh, to see whether it's necessary. Today that's a, a very manual process in many uh, circumstances. The patient uh, gets the prescription, they go to the pharmacy, the pharmacy says I got to have a prior authorization on this, he'll call the doctor, the doctor will call the health plan, try to get it authorized, call the pharmacy back, all of that might take 10 days. In the meantime, the patient's without the drug and sometimes just goes home and says, forget about it. I don't feel that bad anyway. Um, and, the, and there are legitimate reasons that, that, that both parties can provide to say why the other party shouldn't be involved. The reality is they're involved. And rather than going through that process, Cover My Meds automates that. So there's a set of algorithms that have been built that have basically taken these prior authorization requirements and built them into an electronic format that allows both the physician and the pharmacy to get real-time adjudication of those prescriptions before they're dispensed mm -hmm. and before there's a, a financial liability that this is the right script for John and we'll pay for it. And then the outliers are thrown out to call centers when you actually have to have some kind of intervention where people need to get live on the phone where a, 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 a physician at a payer will call the physician that prescribed the drug and have a conversation uh, about the diagnosis and about the treatment plan. Uh -huh. It almost sounds like artificial intelligence actually targeted the right way. It absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. It actually, cool. it is. And, it, and interestingly, it works because it rides on the pipe that I described earlier right. that we have installed on pharmacy where we can hang transactions that sit in the workflow and bring those analytics to the, to the pharmacist without them having to leave what they're doing uh, and, and lose uh, more time where they can't spend it with the patient or with the physician. Does the system get to reach back and look at prior, uh, prior medications, as look for drug-drug interactions at all? Or well, like got, we have other systems that do that, okay. right. but the Cover My Meds thing is specifically, today is specifically related, at least that product from that company is related to the prior authorization. That's exciting. And as these drugs come out and they're more and more expensive, they're going to be more and more prior authorizations. Right. Uh, One of the most interesting things I learned about very expensive uh, meds while going, before I went into the confirmation land, was, um, as you know, the hep C drug that cures you is, is incredibly expensive. And there was a, a conference that I uh, hosted with a bunch of uh, health economists, and one of the people that went, was a good dear friend of mine, is uh, Carl Claxton. He spoke mm -hmm. for Millie before. Carl is sort of one of the resident health economists for the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK. And most people think of the UK as you know, heavy on rationing. We need to maintain our budgets. And I asked Carl, so how do you treat the hep C drug? And he says, we pay for it. And I said, well, isn't it super expensive? And he goes, yeah, but it cures. I mean, the, the, the cost-benefit uh, cost analysis clearly shows this is more efficacious than you can possibly imagine. No one's coming back. Plus, the patient doesn't have to have a liver transplant. Right. Yeah. So it's, it was, that's like, it's like the biggest no-brainer we ever had. Yeah. So um, it's, it's interesting. I know, by the way, the, the, those products now have, much, have a lot more competition than they had before, and the right. price has come down. And you're right. I don't get a customer for life if I'm treating you with that drug. Right. I get, you know six weeks worth of doses and then you're gone and you're cured. So the economics are different. 
So I'm, I'm, we're going to turn to the asking some questions from the, the audience, but I, I want to give you an opportunity. If there's any wild cards you want to throw my way at this point, I'll, I'll accept one or two. <laughs> well, I, I sent you one. You didn't like that one at all. So the second one, <laughs> I, I would say, what, what, uh, what has been your, uh, you, you, you're, an, you're much more of an expert on all of these questions you've asked me uh, than I've asked you. Not so, the McKesson ones. <laughs> uh, so out of, out, of the, out, of the, out of the questions you asked me, which one would you like to answer for this audience? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> wait till I'm after government. Uh, so it's probably the safest one. Um, I think the, the question I guess I'm, I'd like to respond to, or at least one that I get very interested about, is, again, the claims data. I always wonder whether the claims data is as cr creaky of a technology as it is. Cause it's really a 60s, 70s transaction screen screen technology. And MDI managed to at least simplify some of the pieces so it could all come together from different payers and right. have enough fields be there. That um, what frustrates me is I see whether it's um, Optum or other folks grabbing additional clinical data that they want to add to the claims that they'll look at longer term. And the thought is like there are many opportunities like for the radiology information and the lab information and I've, I've written about it in the book I can't mention that if you could only attach that information to the claim um, there might be a way to kind of take this 1960s 70s claims ecosystem and actually modernize it like make it, make it cl much closer to real time because um, when someone submits a claim for a lab value that means they did it right. and that means they have the result. And about 75% of most of the outpatient laboratory right now is basically done by a handful of vendors, and they, it's quite automated. Uh, likewise, with imaging, uh, almost all imaging is digital now. And you never want to attach the image, per se, though probably Amazon Web Services could handle that, maybe. But, but you can at least attach the URL for additional security provisions. And so it's, what, what frustrates me, and I did this when I managed my father's um, end-of-life care, is that the only way I actually knew what was going on and can talk to the Mayo about what was happening to him in Philadelphia before he even got to Minnesota was to look at the claims data. That when I actually asked the University of Pennsylvania, they, they could not verify what was in scratched out chart notes. And the only way I knew was looking at CPT4 codes, right. knowing what MRIs were, knowing the body sites, and then dig digging into actually knowing exactly where to attach those other components. And what frustrates me now is that I see in the claims data from CMS, there are fields. There are fields for these clinical attachments, and they're not being they're used. They're blank, right. I mean, that's, you know, if, uh, it's discouraging. What, what I, mean, I guess it's a question. No, you, no, you can't ask me another question. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're going to get questions from the audience. Yeah, it's fair, it's fair. Okay. I mean, I mean, you just expressed frustration. You really didn't have an answer. I was, I was my, looking for the my, answer. <laughs> My, I'm as my, frustrated my, as you are. My, my, my answer was, and I guess I'll give an answer that I at least put down in writing or some other blog <laughs> previous. That's, that's, I'm kind of restricted to like going back to like historic notes. So my, my summation of what you just said is the codes are antique and we're antique. Yeah, but it could be modernized. <laughs> it could be I mean, modernized. Right. I mean, I, this, this is one area where I think there is a role for, for government, and it's a question of what's the right um, applicability. I remember one of the things that I did when I, I worked on the McCain campaign, if you ever work on a presidential campaign toward the end, you never see the candidate. I think I was on the Straight Talk Express with John and Cindy, you know, for all about three minutes when we got, went like from you know one warehouse in Wisconsin to another uh, one. But after the election, when he lost, he had plenty of time. <laughs> um, and this, we got in this conversation actually about this, saying I was suggesting, what if we paid physicians almost in near real time? And his response was, well, then we'd have fraud going out, you know, out the wazoo. Would you? That, well, that was my response back to him. Why do you think that would happen? He said, because we saw it in the 80s when we had, you know, fee-for-service stuff. I was around here. I saw these things where, and that's why we... Well, it's a different discussion than when you get the payment. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, but he, that's, that's the way he framed it. So it actually became an interesting conversation that led to actually legislation being passed for advanced fraud analytics with the goal of attaching that data and the rationale being that if the data was attached, you can have better AI and analytics to detect fraud and enable real-time transaction processing. So you just express exactly what the problem is with the debate on most of these things, is that you're saying X and I'm hearing Y. You say I'd like to use your data and I hear you saying you want to identify me to my payer and all my problems. 
and all you want is use my data for clinical purposes. You wanted to pay the doctors faster. He said he heard fraud. Right. You want to pay them for fraud. I mean, so when we, especially something as complex as healthcare, we we have to sit down and, and actually make sure we understand what the debate is about and what the end objective is and how we get there and how do we map a plan to get there and how do we not breach somebody's privacy? How do we not pay somebody for fraud? How do we put somebody in jail that should be in jail and not throw the baby out with the bathwater? Exactly. And, and you know, we, what, what we, the government can help us with that, but the government can also throw the baby out with the bathwater and then we wait 15 years to get a change so we can actually put the baby back in the bathtub and start over again because it, it, it sometimes is really difficult when the train has already left the station, doctors commit fraud, we're not gonna pay them. Well, if that's your perspective, then you've gotta, you've gotta bring that tape back <laughs> right. and start it over again if you're gonna reinvent healthcare. Because the doctors are, sure, a doctor will commit fraud, but not all doctors. And they're at the center of this, and they're gonna be at the center of this for the next 50 years. It's not gonna be machines that are gonna treat everybody in this room. It's gonna be machines supporting doctors. Right who can see more patients, who have more time to spend with patients, who aren't caught up in filling out forms and trying to talk to people on the phone. It's, it's going to be a different world if we do it the right way and people can practice at the highest level of their license. Today our pharmacists are counting pills behind counters. How many of you walked into a pharmacy and actually had an engaged conversation with a pharmacist? Most of the time you sign in on one end and you get a tech takes your order and you sign out on the other end and she says, do you want, or he says, do you want to see the pharmacist? And they're back in the counter doing something bigger than worrying about my pills. But well, we've done that to them, and there's a way to undo it, and, it's, and the answer to that problem, frankly, rests with the people in this room, especially the younger people in this room that are at the edge of taking something as terrific as these uh, artificial intelligence, constantly learning machines, and the data and analytics we can draw from them if we unlock the potential. But healthcare is a third rail. I'm just telling you right now, if we're not careful with how we architect this, you will never be able to touch this data. It, it, we have got to find a way to make sure that the people that are concerned about me being identified to the bad people, whether it's the payer or whoever it is, uh, that I feel protected, but you can use my data and access it to make a better clinical decision for me that has better financial results for the system, and that we have a healthcare system that gives us great health care. Uh, otherwise, we're going we're gonna to head in a different direction. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for that pontification. Well, that Questions? Bridget, you must have a question. There's one at the top there. There's one up at the top up there? Okay, we got, one, we got a volunteer up make there. Make sure you, as before, make sure you identify yourself. Oh, up top, okay. Over here, okay. Yep. Hi, uh, uh, Lawrence Cho from the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, thank you, uh, John and Steve, for taking your time uh, this evening. Uh, quick question uh, with regards, I think in, in the very um, uh, beginning we started with uh, industry is changing, right? Uh, there's a lot of different uh, mashups going on uh, and things like that. And I think um, we had John describe your business, um, you know, in the past and what it is today. I uh, would be very interested to hear your thoughts on how you think that your business may even evolve um, as it continues to take part in the healthcare ecosystem with, you know, retailers now getting involved and, you know, payers becoming providers and providers becoming something else. Uh, where, where, I mean, you, you have a pretty interesting seat because you're embedded within the system. Um, how do you see your business potentially evolving? Well, I, I think that the great thing about, about, um, about what we do is we get to do something that's really important. And you get to do it at the Mayo Clinic. There's nothing more important than healthcare. And so that those of you that are involved in healthcare, we should wake up every day and say, this is a great business to be in because, first of all, it's going to grow, and second, uh, because we're doing something that's extremely, uh, extremely important. The second thing I'd say is that it's, it's constantly changing, and the speed with which things are changing is accelerating. Um, I, I don't feel like McKesson's at risk of being disintermediated uh, like, like some industries. If I, uh, um, if, if I was, if I had made a flip phone, I probably would have thought I'd march to the place I wanted to be and suddenly I'm gone because of, uh, of the next generation of phones. So there are certain things that we do that uh, I, ho I hope we can automate out of existence, uh, but, but what, what most of what we do is going to continue to be uh, needed uh, you know, for decades going forward. But the way we do it is going to change. And that, that's the, the kind of efficiency we need to drive into the system, the kind of help and support we need to give 
to those that are actually uh, seeing patients every day uh, is going to increase. The, the pressure on hospitals continues to accelerate. How do we, how do we help them with the challenges that, uh, that, that they have and how do we bring, um, the, re the reason we exist is, is that we're in a many-to-many -many world. Uh, it, it, there are, are so many people at both ends of this relationship that we have that are important, but how do we simplify the complexity for the people at the ends of this, including the patient, uh, uh, to make it easier for everybody to operate and certainly more cost effective. We're, we're going to have to take billions and billions and billions of dollars out of health care if we're going to have any hope of, of treating the people that are coming in, in the next uh, 20 years into the system. Thank you for the question. Thank you for uh, the great reputation that Mayo has built in this great state. Hey guys, thanks a lot. Hey, uh, Rob Parker, I was a Millie graduate in 2013. First, thank you, Dr. P, for your education, for the leaders in this room that experienced it. It's awesome and brought a lot of impact to our, our organizations because of it. Um, my question is a lot of data science is exploratory in nature. We don't know what we're gonna do. We just want some data and play with it and see if we can make some impact. As a leader of an organization, how can I bring that idea to you and get dollars associated with my projects that I don't know what I'm gonna do with yet? Well, that's a really good question because it's very difficult to get dollars from me for anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, I think the, 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 I have a responsibility as a business executive to um, inspire others to understand the value that exists in people like you and the ability to frame something that would appear like an experiment to me to be a, a business case that has a potential of a payback as opposed to an experiment uh, that, that frankly in our business we don't run a lot of experiments. Uh, you know, the, there are, are uh, innovation experiences in the pharmaceutical industry. Our business is not on core development of drugs. We're, we have a different role. Um, and I think even in the core development phase of drugs, uh, there's probably less and less time and money for people that scrape bark off trees and hope that in 25 years they find something out of it. So the, the reality is, is, is that what, what you do actually helps frame a business case for us and can be put into a business case. But the business case, from my perspective, or the, or the uh, deliverable, at least a potential deliverable, has to sort of be designed in, in unison with the delivery of the opportunity set to you. Otherwise, I'm wasting your time if there's, if there's not somebody who sees from a, 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 an output perspective how what you're going to do is going to deliver uh, some kind of of value, whether it's in our generic sourcing activity where we've scanned the globe to try to find the best deal on generics and how do you get analytics around available uh, suppliers or, or supplier shortages, et cetera, so we understand how the markets are moving like a trader would. There's all kinds of things that we can do, but I think that, that I, would, I would encourage us to always connect the, uh, a business leader, uh, manager, somebody who has the, the not the, not the uh, factory, but the the output of the factory, the product in mind, w with those of you that are trying to process the data to create the, uh, the opportunity set and, and to do it in, in some kind of combination. At least that's, that's my perspective. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. Okay. Hello, this is Amaza Reitmeyer, also a proud Millie alum and now working at Medtronic. Um, we talked about two major themes. One is patient ownership and control of data and the challenge of the many-to-many -many relationship. Uh, a friend of mine last week had a son who broke his foot at work, visited an emergency room and had an x-ray done. It was inconclusive, so the next day he went to another health system and because the x-ray, uh, because the, it was a different health system, he had to have a second x-ray done. They couldn't transfer the data despite the fact that the patient was willing to say transfer my data. I use this as an example to say how can we better empower patients to share information across the health system and what role would you imagine McKesson or others playing in facilitating this kind of information exchange? Do you have an answer for that question? Not a great one, but <laughs> if, all right, so, I actually, well, I, 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 I'll give you one answer. I mean, I, I can, it's almost like imagining a world of the future, but I, I, I do like Star Trek, a little more than Star Wars. but. But uh, basically, it goes to an idea that people have talked about before, and I know John and I share this, patients need to own their data. 
The problem is that there's not a technology platform that allows us to own our data, those that want to own their data, in a comprehensive and useful way yet. Um, I mean, I would like it to be the case where, you know, my data de-identified can go into a giant pool and help out and, and advance, give more information on analytics, but yet I can see and use my information and have it be around for a while. And where I get you know, frustrated is I can see different people who have that data. I mean, as someone who does a tremendous amount of analysis work with Medicare claims data, there's, you know, most seniors have no idea that data exists and that the people who actually touch it, uh, I actually try to touch it with high respect because you generally see the last few months of someone's life in a very... Um, Intimate you know, way. Exactly, exactly that. And yeah. yet, we don't have a platform that's telling us just to combine the stuff that we currently have, forget the stuff in the future, just to put it in a place where we can get all the pieces together. And what frust frustrates me, it's not that the technology doesn't exist to do this, it's just the, the laws, the constraints, the privacy, the monopoly components are, are not there to create the business case to make it sustainable for it to actually emerge. I mean, that's the thing, honestly, that excites me about being in a business school with all of you to have you folks ask these questions is that Somebody here will come up with that answer. I don't think it's going to come necessarily from government. Uh, we already saw lots of investment in interoperability, and that didn't produce it. Um, but at least it did produce more technology and more fields so that one could at least think about how to do that. But uh, It's difficult to speak directly to that uh, situation without having a, a few more layers into it. It's possible that the... the, the, the the software that reads the images for hospital number two uh, uh, can't really take the images from hospital number one, put it into the workflow of a radiologist and actually get it read properly. There might be a technical reason why that did it. Right, I, I'm just giving them an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second one might be there's, a, there's an economic motive for the second hospital to say here's another revenue generating opportunity. The patient's not going to care anyway. They're not going to pay for it, and we're just going to move on. And they don't know what it costs, so we'll just do whatever we're going to do. So that that, that would be th that would be the worst case. But I, I I don't I don't know. And it, and it could be I could be a, I could be liable for using the image from the other place because I I I I, I may have a malpractice suit that I should have done the following three or four things, and and I've got to go back and start over again so I make the right diagnosis. So. It, there's not, a, there's not really a, a, a simple, straightforward answer, but that, that same scenario has existed for 35 years, and, and it can't exist for the next 35. And so we're going to have to figure out you know, how we solve it. So I want to give you the chance to solve it. Uh, Susan Alpert, I'm one of the executive re in residence here, and I've been a provider, I've been a regulator, and I've been in the industry. And I You've got the answers then. <laughs> oh, no, I wish I did. Um, what I want is, is to give you both, actually, it's a question for both of you. Um, let's not look at what we have now, but what are three or four key things that you would put into a brand new system if you could get rid of everything that exists now? What are the three, four, or five things that are the characteristics of a really healthy healthcare system? that we should be thinking about. I mean, the goal here was to be looking forward. So let's, you know, I, I just think it'd be an interesting exercise to think, what, what would those characteristics be? And maybe we can use them to begin to move the, the healthcare system, but you both come from very different perspectives with different experiences. So what would you think those three, four, or five things need to be to make healthcare really efficient and beneficial? I don't, I don't know that I, I don't know that I would be the best person to answer the question, but I, I think I know who the best people are to answer the question, and that would be uh, the patients and the providers that are in the system every day. Uh, at least that's where I would start. And, and it, it kind of comes down to where I started earlier, which is there's no transparency for me to make decisions. A anything else I want to buy, I, I know where I can find a, a set of data. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but I can make those decisions. I've got some place to go. I've got some place to go to find cost. I've got somebody who will indicate to me what they believe the quality, to, uh, quality will be. And there's no transparency now for consumers. And, and I, I think if, you, if we begin, the people who begin to give some transparency to the consumers are going to be the ones that begin to win. And, and from my perspective, if we wanted regulators to help us, 
that patient transparency would be the thing that would be helpful. I'm not suggesting that everybody should be required to post a single price online. I'm suggesting I should be able to find out what my price is. I don't, I have, maybe I have no right to see what his price is going to be. It's negotiated with a different plan, different employer, however he wants to do it, but I should know what mine is. And I should be able to pick from a group of physicians that if my payer has these people all certified as in my plan, I should know what, what, what their quality metrics are and is there a cost difference for me to pick this hip surgeon from this hip surgeon? I can't get any of that today. And those are very, those would be really simple things to unlock for people and then you'll begin to get changes. That hospital system, if they, were, if they were inconclusive on the first examination, if they said, we'll do another one for you, we'll get a different radiologist to read it or get a different ER doc to look at it, we'll give you a second opinion right here and now because they we're really interested in the consumer experience, you, you, you might have a change. But. What, what I would like to see that is what happened in, I think, the financial services industry, and hopefully Andy will agree with me, or maybe back me up that I got this story right, but the reason why I focused on fraud analytics when I talked to John McCain was that um, it struck me that uh, the, the credit card industry was faced with a lot of fraud when it first started up. And it actually is one of the best stories of, if you will, corporate cooperation against a bunch of parties that are essentially data, I wouldn't necessarily say lakes, but probably oceans which were the banks. And they, in order to actually make the analytics work for the first phase of really finding how can we detect fraud and stop it before payment even, um, they had to pool their data and agree to pool their data. And then they went one step further and said, it's not just gonna be like Wells Fargo that holds all the data. We're actually gonna stand up three separate or four separate organizations, one of them out of the Twin Cities, Fair Isaac organization, Experian, when it, um, one of our speakers came from there before, uh, Equifax, to basically, and then TransUnion, to basically have identical data on all consumers, on all visa transactions and all banking transactions to get a better predictive algorithm. And then the consumers can access it when necessary for mortgages and everything else like that as necessary. That, that's a 25-year-old, almost 30-year-old story now of cooperation amongst the private sector to agree to a standard not much different than what actually happened with the PBMs right. and Cardinal Health and when they finally put the first data switch together for, for pharmacy. So that's what it frustrates me. This can be done if the incentives are aligned. But right now, most of the incentives are for the data oceans to stay monopolies to never let the channels happen. Don't let the ships go, or if they do, have high tariffs theme there. So um, I would, uh, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a bunch more Panama canals with easy transits to make this stuff work better. Um, I'm Andy Wenton, Chair of the Finance Department. Uh, I, my question has to do with the privacy issue that you had talked about before. That the data is becoming more and more valuable to potential diagnostics and cures and the like. Absolutely true. But part of that increased value of the data is coming from people's genetics, the DNA. And that's going to make it harder, not easier, to de-identify the data. Because if you know someone's DNA, right. you may not know who they are, but you can find them. We've seen examples of this where law enforcement, you know, they go to Ancestry.com or what have you, or you know, 23andMe. They figure out within you know, a small radius who the person is. So I agree the value is there, but I think the privacy concerns are probably going to increase at least as much. I just you know, want your reaction on that. that. That's actually an area where I think regulation does play a role, and I actually think some of it already has, where more or less there was bipartisan legislation uh, to say let's not have genetic information be used for underwriting. And so one can go one step further and say, you know, it is a different type of data that's going to be treated in terms of privacy that sits in there. And there's another exception for that too in healthcare already, which is mental health data. Um, I mean, that, that is treated differently in many respects too, um, in part because of the subjectivity of it, but because of obviously the intimate nature of it, that it's not just a code, it tells you so much more than that. So I think, I think there has to be some, some fences and guardrails about some of this, but there's so much other stuff that still could make it a much richer data environment. And that, and that was the, the point I was trying to make, is that it, it, it would be easy to use that example and say, my data is my data and stopping the conversation. And, and that, that, that would be a shame if we did that. On the other hand, you know, we're, we're moving into an era now where, where a data is, is much more dangerous than it would have otherwise been if it's used in, incorrectly or used in a way that the, the giver of the data didn't intend, right? It's a good point. Yes. I'm kind of John Kim writing back to this question, and I think the main difference is that we're not talking necessarily about having a full 
a full DNA sequence that we need. I mean, and, and I speak as, you know, a PhD candidate, I went out, I scraped my data, I do this, I deal with data all the time, dealt with Medicare all, data all the time, I got annoyed at Medicare data all the time. And the thing is though, I don't need to have the DNA, DNA sequence, I don't need to know who you are. Um, we are talking about the level of de-identification that is a completely common thing across many other fields. The Census Bureau right here on campus has millions of data that is available, it's not identifiable, it's a common practice, they know how to do it, they know where the people could be identified according to certain, um, for example, diseases in this case, so you would you know, take out those particular populations where that would be a problem, but that would already help researchers a lot because then we would actually be able to identify very, very easily almost you know, whether or not there's a clear um, causation really um, according to different properties, according to different characteristics, according to different regressors. And I think you know, that's, that's food for thought and I think that's a huge problem in health. We don't use the other fields and when we're in between fields, we realize that a lot. Just one comment, there is a, while that data is available in the census, there is a distinction between data that's used for research that can help inform decisions and stuff that is right there in real time. And increasingly the two are going to start to converge, but I mean the, the one way, reason we can, the census data can do that is it has a lot of time and a lot of resources to make just the right database. To get what uh, Amaza was talking about, to have it available in real time for clinical components of it, it, that's a much more robust system. And yes, other industries have that in terms of real top-down data, but it's not that common. And having a centralized system really does it, right? I mean, having the census being able with their team to do it instead of having 50 million people according to the insurance cycle, we're not doing it. Right. For sure. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> do we have time for one more question? Absolutely. Or? One last one anywhere out there? Yes. Steve. Yeah, thanks. This has been a great discussion. Um, some of the earlier presenters talked about the incumbents in healthcare can't easily change their business model and they were waiting for the disruptors to come in. So I guess my question is, um, is that true? Do you agree with that? And, and, and can McKesson be a disruptor? How, how will it be a disruptor? Well, I'd like to think that, we're, that, we, that we are a disruptor. We're, we're constantly reinventing ourselves. An example would be the Cover My Meds uh, technology and what we're trying to do to automate something that, that has had armies of people involved up until now, and now technology will forever change the landscape of how those transactions are processed. If you talk about it in a larger context, uh, you know, the, the three-party joint venture that's going to reinvent healthcare. I think that the, the challenges for some of these organizations coming from the outside is they may not know what they're in for. Uh, the, the challenge for all of us that are in the industry, um, don't, don't be naive about what new fresh thinking might do to an industry. I, I think this is a little bit different though g given the regulatory challenges that we have, the complexity of, of the, the raw material that I made a comment about earlier, uh, the, the, the fact that the decision making is, is not uh, in the control of, a, of, a, of an individual and uh, the ability to, um, to penetrate someone's decision around who they're going to trust as a provider and how they're going to pay for their services uh, 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 has been set in stone for a hundred years, you know, or maybe not that long for the payer, but certainly the physician relationship with the patient is something that's going to be very difficult uh, uh, to disrupt, at least with the older generations. So. I think companies that are in healthcare today uh, ought to con con consistently innovate and, and reinvent ourselves, and some of these mergers are going to do that as well. Um, um, on, on the other hand, it's, it's not going to be easy to innovate, uh, reinvent this industry over a period of five or ten years. I just don't think that will happen. Thank you, though, for that Great. question. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for this very honest and transparent conversation. It was, it was really amazing. Thank you. <laughs>